So we thought that we would start off with letting Joy say a few words. I was thinking about this for a while and I had so many flashbacks about things that happened when I was growing up. And especially because our families were so close. Aunt Sadie and Uncle Tony and Sithu and Jiddu lived upstairs from us for a long time. So it was a very different kind of an upbringing than most kids have today, although I think the trend is changing and more of communal living is going to be coming into uh, vogue as the price of housing goes up. But terms like, modern terms like unconditional love is something that mom has taught us for years. I mean, I'm 45 years old and unconditional love has been in practice in our family for years. And I think two of the traits that mom has that I wish I could learn to have, and I'm working on it, but I'm not there yet, is unconditional love and patience. Those are the two things that I think of when I think of mom. Uh, we all had the J in our name, Joyce, Janet, Joan, and Joseph. And how she ever remembered that, I'll never know. <laughs> but some examples to me in my mind of unconditional love is when your mother takes you to the first day in kindergarten and you have an emotional kid on your hands, and I'll tell you, I gave my parents probably the worst time out of everybody. Hey. <laughs> because I was, I was the high strung one. And I'm we sure. never noticed. Never <laughs> noticed. I know a lot of kids cry and scream when they uh, go to their first day of kindergarten, but I'm sure that I shouted a lot louder than the most of the kids. And all mom would say is, Joyce, you're going to love school. All you have to do is listen to what the sister tells you. And she left. And she was right. I did like school. But I was a pain, nevertheless, on that first day. This was the beginning for me of the example of what unconditional love and patience is. We lived on Albany Street, as Aunt Sadie was telling where we had in our neighborhood a fellow by the name of Salvatore Torsha. He was what I call the neighborhood bully. Anytime we were having a good time and the kids on Albany Street used to get together, Salvatore used to try to start fights. And fights he started. He not only had the kids fighting together, he had the mothers on the block fighting with each other over whose kid did this and whose kid did that. And mom would never get involved in this. I'd come home and I'd tell her about what's going on. Mom, I don't know what to do. She'd say, I'm not going to go out there and fight your battles. You're going to have to learn how to deal with it. And I'll tell you, that was a, a real important lesson for me because that is exactly what you have to do in life. You have to learn how to cope with your own problems. And so mom teaching us that at an early age, I think that was really important. Again, that was her way of loving us and helping us to prepare for what was ahead. We um, also had kids in our neighborhood, like little Annie across the street, who could hardly speak English. She was from Italy. And nobody liked her because they thought she was stuck up. Well, she wasn't stuck up. She just didn't know how to communicate. And Mom uh, made sure that I went over and made friends with her. And before you know it, she became one of the Albany Street kids. <laughs> Again, another example of including everybody, making everybody feel at home, not making um, yourself better than the next person just because they can't speak the language. Mom would let us use the garage area in the back. I don't know if many of you remember the Albany Street house. There's no grass on Albany Street. <laughs> Nothing green. A few trees, that was it. It was a big stucco two-story house. <laughs> the back was just a cement driveway with a bunch of open garages. And that was the place where we used to play. And all of us played together. John and David and the little kids and the kids from across the street. And what we would do is we would put on plays. And Mom used to always let us borrow her clothes and borrow her jewelry and whatever it took to 
to put our plays together. And if there was any fighting or screaming, you know, she'd come out and say, okay, kids, time to settle down, you know. But she always let us do our thing. And other things I, I think about in terms of how she ever lived through bringing me up. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> She's still living through it. She's still living through it. She was still living through She's still, still jumping. Uh, <laughs> my husband's inherited it now. <laughs> <laughs> He's the saint. <same. laughs> he is the saint. When I think of the mumps, the measles, the chronic earaches, tonsillitis, sprained ankles, cracking my front teeth, dad rescuing me with the fish hook in my ear that Linda and I got in trouble for. Uh, I mean, the calmer, the more hysterical I was, the calmer she was. And I could never figure out why is she so calm over her, you know? Because I needed her. I needed her to be calm, and that's what unconditional love is. No, they haven't changed. No, they haven't changed. I know. No, they haven't. Uh, Mom taught us several wonderful virtues, I think. Love and respect of our father, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles and cousins. She taught us that we could uh, learn a great deal from these people. For example, uh, my dad, I learned a strong worth ethic and determination. From my grandparents, we were taught how to be spoiled and pampered. And if they were here today, they would be doing it to their great-great-grandchildren. The love and the devotion that I watched between my grandparents, especially being able to live downstairs from Sitha and Judith Volus, was really a tremendous thing to watch growing up because that really does stick in your mind. From my Aunt Mary and Uncle Eddie, I learned to cultivate a love of music and the arts. And Mom always made sure that in the summer I got to spend at least a week at their house. She knew that that was something that they could offer me that nobody else in the family could. I remember when um Mom introduced me to my beautiful Aunt Sadie. Uncle Tony brought his bride home from Lebanon, and they lived upstairs from us. And I remember her saying, you really need to get close to your aunt and help her out because she's got this language problem and she doesn't understand anything. I still don't know. No, you're, you've gone way, way beyond that. Anyway, it was fun because... Um, you used to comb my hair. You I remember? used to comb her hair. She taught me, um, I was too young to need it, but she taught me how to shave our uh, legs with the wax. <laughs> so, uh, but the point was that Mom... Charlene, George. Charlene, right. That Mom taught us that it was really important to respect everyone, whether they were relatives or whether they were people that, you know, were just acquaintances of ours. And I really carry that to this day. I know that in many walks and many experiences that I've had in my life, I've come across some really rude people, and it's very difficult to deal with them. But I always think of how would mom deal with this person? <laughs> and that always helps me out a lot. She was very acceptable of all my radical ideas, the fact that I didn't want to go to Catholic high school. She talked dad into letting me go to a public school. Did you vote for Clinton too? I didn't vote for Clinton. <laughs> I was the first girl in the family to want a college education. She didn't stand in my way there. She, she let me do that. Um, she let me join the choir and travel all over the United States, sing in many different churches, which probably wasn't that acceptable in those days. I sang in the Methodist church, every, every church you can think of. Um, Anyway, I, I remember all those experiences and, and all the hysteria and, and so on that I caused her. And to this day, the thought of unconditional love and patience never goes without thinking of my mother. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> because I voted for Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we talked for a whole hour. We would have been better. <laughs> uh, this, this is kind of a first for me because, uh, well, it's the first time my mother turned eight. <laughs> but it's also the first time in an awful long time that I've got all four of my children in the same room together. <laughs> and that's a big accomplishment. Uh, 80th birthday. Uh, not, not a lot of people celebrate their 80th birthdays, as a matter of fact. I was reading an article some time ago where uh, only 20% of our population reach their 80th birthday. Uh, some of you, some of you younger people look around and recognize that only one of five of you are going to be sitting here someday. Thanks, Dad. On the other hand, <laughs> I'm going to run out to McDonald's. <laughs> yeah, the heck with the diet, George. It's even, Skip it's the even diet. It's more rare for people to reach their 90th birthday. In fact, only about 8% 8, 8 of the population reach their 90th birthday. Um, Is this going to be on the test? No, no, as a matter of fact, no. what will be on the test is who in here wants to announce, this is, this is not your normal one in five population because we have a lot of mom's <laughs> friends are here. Yeah, no. they're, of, they're of your peer group. Who in here wants to admit to reaching their 80th? Now, now, Mr. Zaki, you, you stood up in front of everybody and said, well, you're the oldest one here. Are you the 8% or the 20%? I don't know, but uh, July 20th, I'll be 85. All right. And uh, I will also tell you that my mom's sister is her older sister. Is that right? No. No? No, no. she's younger. Mom's sister is younger. And you used to be the favorite number. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? I always thought it was I'm going to beat you up in a minute. Okay. Yeah, right. I'm going to show up on that. You used to be a, her favorite nephew. I made a fox heard her talk about her aches and pains. And that really is, I think, uh, an accomplishment. And, and it's really important to not adding to the aging process. It's really not how old you are, as far as I'm concerned. But it's really how old you think. If you think old, I think you're going to be old. And I think one of the things I've learned from my mom is never think old, never really think age because it doesn't really matter. What really matters is how you feel and how you're doing that day and maybe what you're going to do the next day. But that's about all that, that really matters. Um, I've got a number of rules that I follow that, that I think probably are based on things my mom taught me. Uh, one of the rules that I follow is never use the O word. I only use it when I talk to people, but I never use the O word. What is What's the O word? word? Never say old. Never say old. Um, you know, you, there, there are a lot of, and I know my mom really rarely, rarely does that. And there's a lot of other words that you can use instead of old, but I just never use it. I also have learned never to start a sentence with three very down, very negative words. And those three words are at my or your age. I never start a sentence with at my age or at your age because you can add so many things to that sentence. At my age, I can't dance. At my age, I can't exercise. At my age, I can't run. At my age, I can't do that. At my age, I can't learn that. You should never really start a sentence with those words. 
sometimes my mom hunts. I was out playing baseball and it was in Washington and and I was in my 40s my early 40s and I wasn't very careful and I ran into I was playing short field and the ball was behind me and the outfielder came running in and we both turned and ran headlong into each other face to face went down on the ground his head came up below mine and opened up my lip and my nose and it was serious enough to go to the hospital and have some stitches done and she happened to call me that night and I, of course I had called from the hospital to make sure that my wife didn't get panicky when I walked home with blood all over the front of my shirt and my a son who can keep secrets well for the first four and a half minutes <laughs> answered, answered the phone and it was my mother and she said where's Joe and she says he said, oh, he's at the hospital. She says, what's he doing at the hospital? He says, oh, he was playing ball, and some guy opened up his nose. <laughs> and so when I got home, the first thing my mother said was, you remember what she said? <laughs> what are you doing playing baseball? <laughs> Those around me know that my memory is not the greatest. Uh, in fact, my long-term memory goes back to last week. Uh, <laughs> I started. One of my one of my people at work gave me these pills, these, these vitamin pills to take to help my memory. <laughs> A link between the two. Oh my God. <laughs> and my very Way first memory of my youth was going into this hospital and just screaming at the top of my lungs with all these people in white things around me uh, and putting the mask over my face. Oh and God. To this day, I hate to have pictures taken. <laughs> and I also remember my first school day. Mom handled my first school day the way she did yours, kind of bounced me into the, into the room and said, You're on your own, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, after a while, it, it was okay. I think it took me a couple of years, but it was all right. Uh, I have very few memories of my grammar school, except my memories start for some reason fading in around the eighth grade. I remember the people in the eighth grade. Of course, I went to Mount. <laughs>